So on to our second speaker. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Christine Montenegro Mendoza um, from the Philippines. Um, Christine is a human rights activist. She is a consultant in the Senate of the Philippines and has worked for the enactment of a new HIV and AIDS Policy Act of 2018, a human rights-centered and evidence-based legislation in the Philippines, which has shifted the policy and response to cater to key affected populations and opened up spaces for harm reductions harm reduction in the country. She's a founding member of Street Law Philippines, an organization of lawyers which provides access to justice for services for people who use drugs in the Philippines. Christine, you have the floor. Bom dia. Uh, it was so good to be out of Manila for a little while. Thank you so much for having me. So, the Duterte's War on Drugs is supposed to be just a three to six months campaign. The promise was to eradicate crime, improve peace and order, and finish the reign of the oligarchs by the rise into power of a supposedly common Filipino who came all the way from impoverished and underrepresented Mindanao, south of the most disdained Imperial Manila. Almost three years later, the war on drugs has unraveled into anything but a war against illegal substances. It has become a platform for a populist dictator who in span of only 33 months was able to undermine democratic institutions our leaders thought we built over the last 30 years. Here's how he's been doing it. He began by issuing a police memorandum circular and a dangerous drugs board regulation which allowed police officers to knock on every door of suspected drug offender to quote-unquote ask them to quote-unquote voluntarily surrender. He then asked the local government units particularly the village chiefs, to come up with a list of known drug offenders and even commanded people to submit names through a drop box, which the police will use as targets for their operations. Then he ordered the Department of Education, the Commission on Civil Service, Department of Labor, all other government agencies to conduct drug tests of students as young as high school and employees with the threat of insubordination and termination for non-compliance. Then, uh, his allies in the legislative, they were able to institute regressive drug policies, the reinstatement of death penalty for drug offenses, lowering the age of criminal responsibility to 12 years old, police subpoena, construction of compulsory rehabilitation centers. Then the Philippine anti-drug strategy was issued with the obsolete objective and problematic approach of demand reduction by eradicating drug use and supply reduction by launching intense police operations, all towards the goal of a drug-free Philippines by 2022. If you'll ask drug users in Manila what does drug-free Philippines mean, they thought we're get, they're going to get free drugs. So that's free drugs in 2022. So what was supposedly a three to six months campaign was extended to two years, three years, and became a long-term, institutionalized, well-funded pseudo-war which centralized all governmental powers to one strong man who through effective social control was able to damage our democratic principles such as checks and balances, accountability and transparency, the civilian nature of our police force, the independence of the judiciary, the rule of law, and respect for human rights. And this democratic reversal did not come without a price. Eighty-one thousand nine hundred nineteen drug operations, hundred seventy thousand people were arrested, five thousand one hundred seventy-six were killed during police operations. At least 29,000 as of February 2019. Homicide cases under 
investigation and 1.3 million drug users who, quote and unquote, voluntarily surrendered. As of Feb February 2019, 29,000 suspected drug offenders were killed and an average of 33 a day. The police already admitted 5,176 who died, died during their operations by their own hands. The rest they call homicides cases under investigations, HCUIs. They were formerly known as DUIs, or deaths under investigation. Same deaths. They wouldn't give their proper term, EJK. Academic institutions already profiled the victims. They're more or less in their 30s, breadwinner, working as pedicab driver or construction worker. Most of them are meth users. Most of them live in the slums of Manila. A high school graduate who couldn't afford a college education has not seen a doctor nor a lawyer in his lifetime, much less afford their services. Of the 29,000 deaths, 5,000 killed by the police, 24,000 still to be investigator, investigated. Because if the police are the suspects, would we expect them to just investigate? So after almost 33 years, almost three years, and 29,000 deaths, so far, we only got one conviction. This is Kian de los Santos, he's 17 years old, high school student. He was suspected as a drug runner, was gunned down a few blocks away from his home. His last words were reportedly him begging the police to let him go because he has exams the next day. One conviction, and it was all because of a CCTV footage which showed police officers dragging him into a dark alley where he was found dead later. Police said the boy fought back a 17-year-old against three grown police officers. They were convicted. Duterte had to invite the boy's parents to the palace. The operations were suspended for a while. A brewing resistance became felt. Activists went to the streets. Church bells began tolling at 8 p.m. Hashtag stop the killings became the national call. And because the resistance became felt, The government had to retaliate. Senator De Lima, who wanted to investigate the killings, has been in jail for 794 days today. Senator Antiveros, who called for a public health approach to drug use, was stripped of her committee chairwomanship and was charged with kidnapping and wiretapping. Chief Justice Sereno, who has been a dissenting voice in the judiciary, was ousted. Maria Reza, a journalist, Time Magazine's Person of the Year, founder of Rappler, has been consistently exposing the abuses of the drug war, was charged with 11 cases, ranging from cyber libel to tax evasion. Bishop David and other priests who have been speaking against the killings are berated by the president on an almost daily basis on national TV. Other opposition leaders, local officials are linked to the narcolist, media practitioners, critics, all suspected of being connected to an alleged ouster plot. Activists are tagged as communist lawyers killed. Indeed, it is almost helpful to remind ourselves of what Voltaire said. It's a dangerous thing to be right when the government is wrong. So in span of almost 33 nauseating months since the launch of this drug war, the territory was able to spur a human rights crisis of unprecedented magnitude in Philippine history on the basis and the singularity of his narratives. that drug users are not humans, they're not entitled to human rights. All those protecting them are either drug lords or drug cuddlers. They're all enemies of the state. While six out of seven Filipinos are reported to worry about extrajudicial killings, it is puzzling to think why the war on drugs remain to be popular. But it, it is still popular. 78% of Filipinos are satisfied with the war on drugs. It remains to be the dominant narrative. Duterte even promised that his last three years in office is going to be as chilling as ever. He even incre increased the target from 3 million to 78 million Filipino drug users. He even prodded the main architect of his drug war, the former chief of police, Bato de la Rosa, to run in the midterm elections this May. 
is now number four in the survey. And if the midterm elections are a referendum of this anti-drugs campaign, it seems that majority of Filipinos approve of it so much that they're even willing to hand over this Verdugo a seat in the Senate. It seems that we'll all be losing the independence of the last frontier of our democracy. It's also been a year since the withdrawal from the ICC was submitted and it has now taken effect. Although this will not excuse liability for crimes against humanity committed during our membership, the investigation has yet to start, the killings still continue, it has spread out in the countryside, again, that's still 33 deaths a day. Though the next three years will probably remain to be grim, bleak, and definitely do not spark joy, there remain small, few, but growing forces of resistance. These groups have been, underground, have been doing underground human rights work amidst threats to their security. Uh, Faith-based groups, which provide spaces for people who use drugs, EJK victims and their families. Artist groups that continue to challenge the narrative of the drug war through films, performance art, poems, and visual art. Photo journalists, such as the night crawlers, in fact, the speaker today, supposedly Rafi Lerma, unfortunately had his uh, visa denied. He had been at the site of the killing since the war started and has kept on documenting and sharing the stories of the victims. The academe, which fairheaded Drug Archives PH, uh, that's the Ateneo de Manila University, University of the Philippines, De La Salle University, and Columbia University School of Journalism, uh, they got this database of all the info related to the war, that's Drug Archive PH and civil society organizations like No Box Philippines, which has been doing pioneer work in harm reduction research and training in the Philippines. Local government officials, who in the exercise of their local autonomy are brave enough to do community-based harm reduction programs that have been saving lives of those in the drug list. Groups of lawyers who have been challenging the constitutionality of the police memorandum, working with communities and documenting the EJK cases and providing access to justice services and legal assistance to people who use drugs. This war actually gave birth to Street Law Philippines, a group of lawyers who saw the need to protect the rights of Filipino drug users. We educate them of their rights, we train them to be par paralegals, and we will be starting to provide direct legal services for strategic litigation that will hopefully open spaces for drug policy reform. This is during one of our paralegal trainings. And this is uh, with Gadi Uriston, Street Law, Denmark, our mentor Nana is here. And of course, our glimmer of hope, our source of inspiration, an organization of people who inject drugs in Cebu City which has set up a drop-in center and conducts outreach under an HIV program. The director, Panky Nadella, is supposed to be here uh, in this conference, but his visa was not granted also. So with the new HIV and AIDS Policy Act of 2018, we hope that their harm reduction work will be protected and supported by the Department of Health. The war on drugs in the Philippines has not only caused the loss of thousands of lives, but has also caused the demise of our democratic ethos. In 1986, we asked the former di dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, to People Power Revolution, which started a wave of democratization. 33 years later, we elected a new, direct, a new dictator who is now leading a trend of democratic reversals in neighboring countries, launching their own violent campaigns against drug offenders, Duterte's time. As human rights activists pick up the pieces and continue to push back, we can only remain hopeful that international pressure will keep on pouring, that the movement continue to struggle, and that we remain angry, realizing that the best way to protect our rights is to exercise them, most especially what's left of it. As of now, there's nothing left to do but to continue with our work, and in Thomas Paine's words, to rage, rage against the dying of the light. Obrigada, thank you, maraming salamat.
just a quick announcement. Stop the killings uh, has been traveling. It has been to Manila, uh, in various states in the U.S., in Colombia, actually. And the banner is coming to Porto. We are inviting you all to a mass action outside this building on May 1st. That's Wednesday after plenary. See you all there.